Hello and welcome to the WISP News Desk. I'm Chris Stafford alongside Nancy Gillen, who's in London, recovering, and she'll explain why in a minute. And this is June uh, the 2nd that we're recording, and, and this is already Season 4, Episode 20. Nancy, explain why you're recovering. It was quite the story, because we sent you off last week thinking you were going to have this nice little sort of training exercise in the hills of northern England. Yeah, so I was I signed up to do a, a trail run in the Lake District, uh, so a trail half marathon. Um, and yeah, the, the event kind of ended up uh, being not as described um, due to a last minute change of route uh, because of nesting birds on the original half marathon route. So yeah, they ended up, uh, the organisers tripled the elevation to 1,600 metres um, and the d- distance in the end ended up being 25 kilometres as well, which is quite a significant amount over a half marathon. Um, and yeah, it essentially just kind of turned into a, re- um, a bit of a challenging hike. It wasn't, there wasn't really much running and more kind of like climbing up uh, steep hills and and kind of scrambling down uh, even steeper drops. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. It took us, um, I was with some friends, so there were five of us doing it. It took us uh, seven hours, which was a lot longer, probably double the amount of time that we uh, had expected to to get the the race done. But yeah, I think it was... (sighs) It, it wasn't the most well-organized event. Um, and I think probably the strong argument that it was actually pretty dangerous, but I did ultimately have a good time. I think it, if I, the fact I was with my friends made it fun. I think if, if I had been by myself, I probably would have uh, <laughs> sat down and cried for a bit or something, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was a good weekend ultimately. Yeah. Well, at least it was a different adventure to what you norm- normally used to, uh, but you, it wasn't what you expected. No. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I don't think you could define it as a, as a trail run. So yeah, I've still, that's still an experience. Um, I still want to do that at some point in the future. Yeah. Just hope, hopefully one that's a bit better organized. Yeah. Well, hopefully, and you're no worse for wear. No, I mean, I got a bit sunburnt, but that's it really. But in terms, you know, that, that goes after a few days in terms of kind of like muscle injuries or anything like that I came away unscathed. So that's, that is what is most important. Yeah, absolutely. You'll be ready for your, your to get back into training. I know you're having a few days off here and then you get back into training because you are planning to do another marathon, aren't you? Yeah, I don't quite know which one I want to do yet. Like potentially, I think there's a few in October, but I think that might just not be feasible. But uh, Leeds now has a marathon, which is taking place next May. So yeah, maybe maybe eyeing up that as a potential. Um, so yeah, as soon as I, after I've, I've had this little break, I'll be back out running again. Yeah, well, good. Stay stay fit. I'm trying to do the same here as well with my cycling, getting ready um, for a big ride uh, later in the year. More of that another time. But let's get straight to the news this week, Nancy, because obviously the, the big story is the um, Grand Slam that's happening at Roland Garros in France, the French Open Tennis. It's uh, getting closer and closer to the final now. So um, give us an update. As this goes out on Thursday, the 2nd of June, we're very close to the final. So... Tell us what we can expect and what your prediction is. Yeah, so really, um, I think quite exciting final. So I think to the surprise of absolutely no one, um, I guess Whitech, including the, you, yeah, including me, um, I guess Whitech um, is in the final of the French Open. She um, beat uh, Castakina six two six one, so a very comprehensive victory, especially in a semi final of a Grand Slam. Um, I believe that's now her 34th consecutive victory and she's um, coming right up behind the two Williams sisters uh, for the longest running streak um, in the 2000s. I think I think it's Lindsay Davenport or someone along those lines who has an absolutely ridiculous winning streak uh, set um, in the 80s or the 90s. Um, but yeah, Swiatek is coming up fast behind the Williams sisters um, in terms of record record uh running record wins um and uh yeah the the, the person that's going to be challenging her is Coco Goff uh the American tennis player who seems like she's been around for absolutely ages but she is only um 18 years old um as she first kind of burst into the scene I think when she was like 15 which is why it seems like she's she's just been about for a long time um, it is actually her first ever Grand Slam final um, and she beat Martina Trevisan 6-3, 6-1 uh, 
uh, in the semi-finals to get to the final and yeah, she has a really, really, really stern test. I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to that final. It's two very young, talented female tennis players. Um, say probably Switek has been able to, um, I think, kind of prove herself maybe a bit more on the on the at the top stage. You know, golf has been around for a while, but ha- like I said, has only now just got to a Grand Slam final compared to Switek, who won the French Open in 2020. Um, and for me, I'm going to have to back Switek just because I think she looks pretty invincible right now. It looks like no one can really beat her. She's winning every, nearly every match very comprehensively in two sets. Um, so yeah, that's that's my bet for the for the final. But it should be a really exciting encounter. Well, great experience for Coco, if nothing else. Yes, definitely. Yeah, to have that kind of exposure at this point in her career. And you mentioned how you know she's been around since you know she was a young age of fifteen. And it reminds me of a tweet I saw recently. You know, Gabriela Sabatini, the Argentina tennis player, who was WTA star for many many years in the eighties. 70s, 80s. Um, she's been retired a while now. I think she's turned 50, but she's playing in the veterans at Roland Garros and uh, in, in the doubles and going really well at the moment. But it, what I did see her tweet a few days ago was the first time she played there. She played Chrissy Evert when, and, she, and, and Gabby was 15. Wow. So, yeah. That's an experience. <laughs> yeah, that's some experience. But yeah, te- technically they haven't lost their touch. You know, they may be veterans. They may be in their 50s or 60s, whatever now. You can be in your 40s, I think, or even less for the veterans. You know, it's only once you're retired from the circuit, you can become a veteran. And, uh, that you know, they're just so court savvy. It's all about economy of effort, right? And that that's, yeah. that's what sport is all around, right? All about, you know... <laughs> <clears throat> be streamlining and making it as efficient as possible and, and these women are so court savvy it's great fun to watch um, so yeah don't forget the veterans because they play at most uh, Grand Slams uh, and they are great fun to watch all right, we, we have a story that's just come out of Roland Garros, uh, and which is capturing the headlines right now uh, on, on social media. And it's a quote by Amelie Moresmo, who, former WTA player herself, who took over the directorship of Roland Garros last year. Uh, and she said something quite shocking. Um, and disappointing and surprising. And Iga Swiatek had something to say about it. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 what she said was, um, she, I think there's been quite a bit of a debate about, uh, in the French Open, the men's matches have been, um, taking place in the evening, kind of when you've got more of a crowd and it's, you know, it's more of a blockbuster event. Um, and yeah, Maresimo basically said that that scheduling had happened because, uh, she didn't feel that the women's matches had as much appeal as the men's matches. Um, yeah, which, like you said, is quite a shocking thing to say. And as someone who I know, like we've kind of described her as a bit of a trailblazer in tennis in terms of, you know, she's she's a female kind of organiser of a Grand Slam. She has been the coach of Andy Murray. So like a, a female coach, a male player. That was, I mean, I remember at the time it was quite a... Uh, people were talking about it, you know, it was something that you don't really see much in tennis. And that's a kind of suggests that women's tennis isn't as appealing as men's tennis is, yeah, very disappointing. And I think inaccurate as well, to be honest. I think that there's women's tennis is brilliant at the moment. It's incredibly entertaining. Um, so yeah, Switek, I think, uh, said that it's uh, her words were a little bit disappointing and surprising uh, and that she thinks women's tennis has a lot of advantages um, and that yeah it's really really appealing so yeah I think Swisex's right to kind of I think speak out about it and say that she's disappointed because it is it is yeah it is a very disappointing kind of point of view to have for someone who's so you know Right, from significant in tennis from yeah and a woman and a woman yeah yeah and apparently just there's just been one women's match uh, featured in the night session compared to nine of the men yeah which and and that is like that in itself i, I just i i don't i don't you know like maybe the men play five sets and maybe some people prefer that and maybe see it as more entertaining but you can't say that you know some of the women's tennis matches that have been happening at the French Open have not have not been entertaining. Um, so yeah, that that is uh, 
it's not great that it's kind of, you know, she said that she doesn't find women's tennis as appealing. And then that is actually at a disadvantage to the women because they're not being put on for the night matches. Like that whole, it's, it's just very archaic for you, I think. Yeah, and and even Pam Shriver, you know, former WTA player, now she's a commentator herself. Uh, she said it was crossing the line, um, and it's not acceptable. And I, I think she's going to get a lot of backlash from this, um, Emily. It's disappointing. It's surprising, and it's politically incorrect for a, a, a person in that position too. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I f- yeah. Regardless I f- of I her, agree. you know, of her, per, you know, personal feelings, I think you know politically i think it's incorrect yeah no i do agree and yeah it's just i think it's it's just a shame that it's kind of something that that will overshadow what's been a really great tournament so far yeah yeah Uh, well talking about gender equality uh which we're always doing on this show (laughs) (laughs) one way or the other we have a couple more stories here too and one of which is um, concerning tennis and it's about Wimbledon who do seem to be catching the the, the headlines just lately not always for the right reasons that's coming up soon the Wimbledon championships but the All England Lawn Tennis Club as it's called has decided to change the honour roll uh, and drop the titles for women which it had always had on its honour board forever right never for the men but for the women so we're getting equality and they're just going to put the uh the the initials instead of the title miss mrs or ms yeah exactly so yeah like as an example so as it currently is uh it would say on the board like miss uh s williams or miss a barty but on the men's board, it's just N. Djokovic or A. Murray, or you know, they they don't have that that um, that that um, initial. I don't know what it's called, but yeah, they've taken that a bit at the start out. Yes, the so that's that's now going. So I think that's um, quite significant as well. And like you know, obviously Wimbledon is very traditional. So I think to. You know, and it's it, maybe you, you could say you know it doesn't mean much. It's just on a board, but it's. I think if you want men and women to be treated the same in sport, that includes those tiny little things like that, and just making sure that men and women are like presented the same way. Yeah, um, and just uh, just for the record here, Emily Moresmo will be a Moresmo now from t- the 2006 winner of Wimbledon, uh, mm. and uh, I bet I know who you think is going to win the 2022. Well, so I yes, I mean, I can't see anyone stopping Swisek right now, but I don't know. I don't know how good she is on grass. I, I don't really uh, recall seeing her play on grass that much. So maybe it might kind of switch up a little bit. Um, you know, I'd love to see Radicani have a good run at Wimbledon again this year. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. That will be nice. All right, so Wimbledon will be here before we know it. Um, but let's move on to some rugby stories now. We've got a couple of stories coming from the, r- the world of rugby union, and, and it involves the men's rugby union game, um, and, and that, that is that there's going to be all-female official team, and the and that US and also USA referee Kat Roche has been named the assistant referee for the Rugby World Cup. So, some good stories coming out of rugby for women's offici- officials. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, a lot of kind of female officials making a name for themselves. So, Holly Davidson uh, will lead an all-female team of match officials for uh, next month's men's match between Portugal and Italy. Um, so they, yeah, they're going to be the first um, all-female team to lead a men's rugby union to officiate a men's rugby union match, which is obviously very uh, significant. Um, and it's also the first time a female referee has officiated a men's Six Nations team in a test match, with, with Italy being part of, of the Six Nations. Uh, so Davidson, as always, with with these women who are kind of making waves, um, she's very experienced. She became Scottish Rugby Union's first full-time professional women's referee in 2017, and yeah, has um, officiated a, a lot of, of a lot of big matches, including ones in the United Rugby Championship. Um, and then yeah more good news as well with um, the Rugby World Cup with um, the assistant referees being named and yeah USA Rugby referee Kat Roach among among that number as well so yeah some really good to see across all sports it's always great to see female officials um, included so yeah that's a very encouraging sign
we're going to turn now to another story coming out of the UK again, and this is uh, one from Sky Sports News, and it's something I think uh, we've, we've we've got to work on this, Nancy. We've got to, I don't know what we do, start a campaign, because there's only three female sports statues in the UK. Yeah, it's really poor. So there's 240 statues of sports people in the UK in total. Only three of these are female athletes, so that's less than 2% um, are female athletes. So it's uh, former England footballer Lily Parr, two-time Wimbledon champion Dorothy Round, and the Olympic pentathlon winner uh, Lady Mary Peters. So that's only... uh, Mary Peters is the only one that's still alive out of that trio. Um, so Sky Sports did a did a, an interview with her, but yeah, like that. This is something that's going to change, and it's. Um, I don't know if you remember Chris the Adidas campaign that they did a few. I think it was a couple of months ago where they uh, put some statues of female athletes, including Vivian Miedema, yeah. the Arsenal yeah, player, sure. um, and put them. Yeah, put them by London. I think it was around about London Bridge, somewhere around there. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, those statues were temporary, so they weren't permanent. So, hopefully, hopefully, with with these investigations and and studies, and we can kind of start to realise how little representation there is for for women in, in things like statues. And yeah, if we can get a few more permanent ones, not just you know temporary ones, that would, that would be brilliant. Yeah, that's very interesting that they've got Mary Peters because Mary Peters is uh, from Northern Ireland, isn't she? She's Yes. So yeah. She, she, yeah. So you know they're not just relying on on athletes from the mainland. Yeah. It's uh. Well, yeah. And I mean as well, I think it's it's not like they've got a lack of like you know a small pool of athletes to draw from. <laughs> like this can't you know Britain has the UK has produced like so many um incredible sports women yeah. like so many um. So yeah, it's it's just obviously that they're deciding not to build statues of women, which is pretty, uh, yeah, pretty sad. I expect you to be out there campaigning. And- <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I will I'll, I'll, I'll be working on it. Start a movement going there. Awesome. All right, we're going to turn to sailing now for another equality story, and and this is thanks to the Ocean Race. You know the Ocean Race, which happens every few years. The next one's coming up. I think they start at the end of at the end of this year. Um, I'll get that right in a minute. It only happens every few years. Uh, but, but they have a new um, target now, and they're aiming for the equal number of male and female sailors for, for this Round the World event by 2030. You know, this is not the first equality story we've seen out of sailing. They're really making an effort, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, I think it's good to have kind of these like targets and setting setting a deadline for targets because it's it, you know it's not just kind of oh we're you know we're working to improve gender equality or, or whatever it, it gives them an actual deadline to work, work towards and ensure that it happens um so yeah like you said we've had other stories of sailing as well and, and the ocean race is one of the it's kind of one of the most prestigious isn't it and, and also also the toughest like i think oh, yeah. having that you know an equal amount of men and women competing in that and proving that they are as just as tough i suppose as, as the male sailors is, is really good so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm 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 sure that they will be able to you know that's that's gives gives them eight years to to work towards that and you know hopefully they should they should be able to achieve that yeah and they do start later this year they start in alicante um, so they'll that. finish in Spain, and so they'll finish uh, January. I think they said next uh, next next January. Uh, sorry, it starts in January. Um, so yeah, and they have stopovers all over the all over the world. It's a really really thrilling race. Do you follow it? I don't know. I don't. I, I I'm aware of it, but I don't. I haven't actually at any point kind of sat and followed it. Um, <laughs> You know, live as it's as it's been happening, but this, yeah, I'll give it. I definitely give it a go when it yeah. when it starts next year. It is very very exciting, and and you know the the sailors they they are so tough. I have to say they are incredibly tough. But the, yeah, they start in uh, they start in Spain, and uh, and then they'll finish. Uh, I think they finish in Geno- Genova in Italy, uh, so that however months later so like about six months it takes to do this um but yeah very 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 exciting so good for them um the ocean race is aiming for equality 
uh, because they, uh, they went for the mix crews. I think that's that's how it started. They were they you know that you know they had an all female crew back in 2015. I think it was the team SCA. Yes, I do remember. Right, you remember that. And then we yeah. heard that there was going to be mixed gender teams, and now there's two different types of boats as well. So they're looking to increase their their uh, the you know the female sailors amongst them right across the board. So good for them. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's our next story? This is an endorsement deal, student athlete endorsement deal. What have you got there, Nancy? Yeah. So th- this is an interesting one uh, because. It- because of um, kind of, I suppose, like the regulations in the US, obviously student university sport is very big um, and quite a profitable industry as well. But um, NCAA rules prevent a lot of the athletes from making money. They don't get paid and they can't really have like endorsement or sponsorship deals. Um, so you may remember, I think it was around la- la- this time last year or maybe even slightly later, Um, They have relaxed some of those rules now so that student athletes can start to have kind of endorsement deals. And uh, yeah, Rose Zhang, uh, American golfer, she's actually the world number one amateur golfer um, of the US, um, has become the first student athlete to agree a name, image and likeness endorsement agreement with global brand Adidas. Um, So yeah, the name, image and likeness network which is going to, is run by Adidas, will aim to involve uh, involve over 50,000 student athletes across 20 free sports and 101 D1 universities. So eventually it's going to be, there's going to be quite a few athletes um, with this, but Rose Zhang is the first. And uh, yeah, she'll now be able to make money from social media posts and essentially have more control over her image, I suppose, and profit from it, which I think is, is only right. Um, yeah, so Zhang will be competing in the US, US Women's Open, which uh, starts tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, just quite an interesting story there, I think. And, and you know, um, kind of points to a different, you know, a change in culture in America um, around student athletes. Yeah, and actually that ties into another story I wanted to talk about to the retirement, quote unquote, of a top player uh, just now because in January earlier this year the United States Golf Association they nearly doubled the US Women's Open prize money to 10 million with a winner of this year's championship earning 1.8 million which is the single richest payout in women's golf and wow. yeah I mean which is pretty impressive because only a year ago there was only three women on the tour that earned more than 1.8 million um, and the prize money for the men's is 12.5. Uh, but I think uh, the plans are to bump the, the women's purse to 12 million in a few years. So, you know, with the payout then of, of golf industry sponsorship contracts awarded to top players, I mean, they w- really do overshadow most of the of the best women. But, it, you know, it really is interesting how that, that payroll is climbing um, in in golf and that's a serious payout but it leads me to the story i wanted to mention i think i told you uh earlier this week uh, nancy that michelle wee west i don't know if you remember her she was one of the best golfers since she was 10 years old i think she's in her early 30s now um she she's not calling it retirement but she's going to step back from the sport uh, I think she's 32 now, uh, and she's just going to step away. And she's no plans after um, the LPGA tournament in uh, this year. Uh, the only other event she expects to enter is 2023 US Open at, at Pebble Beach Golf Links. Um, so she's stepping back from the sport. She'll be missed, I'm sure, because she really was one of those top players. And uh, this will be the last uh, tournament for her for a while at Pine Needles. So. She's enjoying it while she can. So, uh, yeah, uh, there is money in golf, which reminds me, you know, our intrepid hiker, which we talk about every week because Marcy Cornegay, if you're not following this, Marcy Cornegay, who is a former coach, uh, golf coach, she's actually hiking the Pacific Crest Trail right now. She's 365 miles in. I spoke to her this morning, Nancy, and she's going strong. Uh, yeah, and she's got 2,650 miles total. So, uh, yeah, she's currently 
just north of LA, and, and she's obviously going from the Mexican border to the Canadian border, and that's going to take her about four months. But uh, I'd imagine a stroller in a golf course after you've done that would be quite welcome, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it'd be a nice recovery. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. All right, uh, let's talk about the Olympics, Nancy. The, yeah. The, because we talk about the Olympics all the time here, but, you know, the sports come and go. For the Olympics, right? And, and most sports have to compete for to maintain their position on the roster, right? And they have to be inclusive, and uh, they have to have the global numbers, and you know the reach. Uh, there's a lot of criteria there. But now they're talking about uh, the Los Angeles Olympics, which is after Paris, of course, and in 2028, and they're talking about bringing in potentially. Something that I don't know how they even call cheerleading a sport. Do you? No, I don't. Yeah, for me, it's it's not a sport. To be honest, uh, yeah, it's it does. So it has surprised me. I think to see it's uh, up for inclusion at, at the Olympics. And and you know, somebody up high makes these decisions. They're going to look at other potential newcomers like uh, cricket, flag football, and lacrosse. And meanwhile, there, there's a question over um, what you would imagine would be front runners going into an American uh, venue for the Olympic Games, uh, baseball and softball. You'd think they'd be a given, um, but not, uh, not so, apparently. I um, think they've got to fight for their position. I get lacrosse. I think lacrosse, potentially, you know, why not be an Olympic sport? Um, it's played far and wide. Flag football? Not so much. Like, I don't even know why cheerleading and flag football are even even considered. Do you? No, oh, yeah. And I think, like you said, I just don't think have that universal popularity either. Um, I think, yeah, definitely there's some sports you can have an argument for. But, yeah, if it's something that's going in the Olympics, so you, you need to have enough kind of established, like, setups and teams around, around the world. And, for, yeah, cheerleading and flag football aren't quite there for me. No. Well, we'll keep you posted here. We'll, you know, there's still time for others to come along. And a modern pentathlete has got to get their act together, haven't they? They've got to have a substitute sport for for riding um, yep. finalised if they're going to stay in. Equestrian sports have always had a battle to stay in, uh, again, for universal inclusivity. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure this uh, story will keep keep on running for a long time. So check in with us here at the Wisp Sports Desk every week. And Nancy and I will keep you updated. Uh, anything else, Nancy, on this week's roster? Um, no, not. I think no more news stories. Um, yeah, just just looking forward to the French Open uh, final at the weekend. I suppose it's after that, it's a relatively quiet period of of uh, for women's sport. Not too much happening, but then we've got Wimbledon and the Euros to look forward to. So, yeah, some exciting things on the horizon. Yeah, Wimbledon obviously coming up very very shortly. Then, um, when did when does the Euros actually start, Nancy? Uh, so July sixth. So coming up okay. to a month out now. Yeah. All right. We've got a little while, but it'll be here before we know it. And you're just going to be unbearable for how long? <laughs> how many weeks is it? <laughs> Uh, four weeks, four weeks. It's, yeah, football is going to be at the top of my agenda. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All right, I may not be able to talk about any other sport then for those four weeks. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we just take a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A Euros, Euros and Juice break. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, Nancy. Well, that about wraps it up. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Yep. So Twitter, I'm on uh, at Nancy underscore Gillen. Instagram, I'm on Nancy Gillen underscore sports. And then uh, Give Me Sport Women is where all my work is. And yeah, you can find us on Twitter at, um, at Give Me Sport W. Excellent. And we, of course, are at With Sports. Join us again next week for more news from around the world of women's sports. I'm Chris Stafford alongside Nancy Gillen. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.